Hi, everyone. This is Rob Gray from ASU and the Perception Action Podcast, back with another article review. In this one, I want to look at um, Wolfgang Schulhorn and colleagues' recent paper titled, Always Pay Attention to Which Model of Motor Learning You Are Using. Um, so models of motor learning are getting an interesting run right now. Uh, as I'm going to talk about in an upcoming episode, some people kind of questioning whether we need them at all, whether they're just, you know, uh, the term psychobabble that doesn't really have any important real application. But, I, you know, I so I want to kind of, in future episodes, I'm going to kind of get into this more. But I wanted to start with this paper because I think it's interesting. Um, and I wanted to look at some of the aspects of it and kind of touch on some of the things that, that, that are addressed in it. So this paper, I'll start off with, is a very challenging read, right? It has a lot in it. It has a lot of philosophy of what a theory is. Um, it touches on replication crisis and issues of that. And it goes into different ways of classifying models of learning um, with a lot of historical information about where they came from and things. So there's a lot of good information in here. I find it was hard to kind of pull it all out. Uh, but I'll do my best I can and kind of comment to everything. And I, I think it's interesting to see how other people classify the different models of motor learning. So one really interesting point the authors raise in here, as I said, is the issue of replication, right? And as most people know, rep the replication crisis in kind of behavioral science has been a huge point over recent years. You know, it's been shown that a lot of findings that are published in psychology research uh, journals and other fields as well have, when people have tried to replicate and show the same result, they, they haven't found it for various reasons, right? Um, you know, it's possible bias in publication, small sample sizes, underpowered, so on. So there's been a big movement, right, in, in the open science framework and things like that to replicate studies, right? So not just putting one off, here's a study that shows the internal focus of attention is worse, let's leave it there, right, trying to replicate. And um, the uh, what the point uh, Scholhorn and colleagues raise is that, you know, an interesting idea that if we accept that uh, learn, we're complex adaptive systems, right? That um, we have this ever-changing interaction between constraints in our environment. Can we ever really replicate results, right? Because even the different people we're going to use in different studies are going to bring different things to the table. And I'll read this quote. Although the repeated learning of a movement by the same person would likely most closely represent direct replication, the initial conditions change fundamentally with the first learning. Despite the constant changes of living systems being known, the extent of such changes has so far received little consideration in the discussion of replication. The majority of studies on motor learning focus only on objective information from the external point of view, and widely we neglect the constantly changing subjective information of the learner, end quote. So I think this is a really interesting point. I don't really have an answer to it or anything like that. But if you look at really some of the, what are some of the classic findings in motor learning, like the random versus block practice, internal versus external is a good one because, uh, you know, Gabby Wolf and colleagues just published a recent systematic review of like, I think it's 25 years of research now showing the benefit of external focus of attention. If you look in that literature, there aren't really many, if at all, direct replications, right? A direct replications where they use the exact same sporting task, same conditions, everything, and they try to replicate Wolf or, or mine or anybody else's findings, right? Most of them are more conceptual replications, right? So let's try to show external is better in this different set of conditions, right? So as a lot of people, and particularly I know Keith Loesch has talked about this, we really haven't been good at all in sports science and motor learning about replication. And maybe this is part of the issue. So I just kind of want to raise that to start. Um, but <clears throat> let's get into the, this actual paper. As I said, what they were trying to achieve in this paper is to um, kind of class create a classification system for models of motor learning, right? And they represent, you know, the they they confirm the authors for me believe it's important to really be clear about what uh, model you're using because it it talks about you know it, it defines the manipulations you're going to use the measures you're going to use and, and so on so they they that is a really important uh, point to them right so they said um, they they talk about the different models the different kind of um, you know, pulling in different motor learning, coordination, skill acquisition, they bring in these different models. 
and they try to group them. As I said, there's a large historical component to them, which is I found really interesting to read. I'm not going to go into all of it here, but I think it's really interesting. And what they do in well, the authors of this paper, they come up with seven different basic models of motor learning, repetitive learning, discovery-based learning, methodical series of exercise, methodical game series, variability of practice learning, contextual interference learning, and differential learning. Okay. So I'm going to go through all of these and talk about them. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm not going to, in this presentation, I'm not going to do too much of my own critique. I don't agree with this organization, right, at all. I think, uh, I don't think it, some of it doesn't, isn't very useful breaking these things apart. You also see, you know, not surprisingly, this this view. I, you know, it's, it's not biased, but it's very heavily pointing to the fact that differential learning is the best model of motor learning. Right? It covers all the things. Not surprising, based on the authors. So, but I'm going to talk about some issue, some points here and there. I'm not going to do like a thorough review of of what I think. I just kind of want to give you the information from this paper. As I said, it's not an easy read, but I think there's some imp interesting things in here you might like to hear about. So the models are distinguished. Um, they come up with um, five different ways that you can distinguish the models. And I think this is kind of useful. Um, we can talk about how much guidance is given by the instructor, right, the coach. Is it heavily supervised or prescriptive, or is it completely self-organization? Number two, how, much, how many degrees of freedom involved in the movement? Is it very low or using a very simple task, or are we giving you lots of options, okay? What are the sensory systems? This was an interesting twist, and this is something I'm beginning to think of more about a lot um, as we go. You know, a lot of the things you know I've been talking to people about, for example, the internal versus external. And, I, and in my past episode, I think I, I got into this a little bit, but you'll notice that a lot of the times, external instructions are visual, and internal focus of instructions are kinesthetic, right? Focus on the snap of your wrist versus focus on the rim. Right. So I think this is an important thing. I think we really haven't touched on a lot in our what in our models, in our, our coaching. What what sensory system are we engaging? Okay. Processing. Are we doing things in step by step and serial? Are we are we promoting parallel? And what stage of learning are we addressing? Right. This is a big point Newell always raises too. Are we talking about real acquisition of a skill that person has never performed before? or a refinement or a, a stabilization of something they've already done, right? So I think that those are important points. Okay, so let's get into the actual models. And in the, if you're, in the, if you're listening to this on the podcast, I, I have a YouTube video you can go to and see the kind of the figures, or you can go to the paper itself, right? They create um, models of motor learning. Um, some of the models are focused on developing a sing single technique, you know, the repetition discovery, Series of exercise variability of practice, certain types of, of, of constraints that approach are so repetitive learning is the same movement is repeated. Okay. Um, discovery based uh, learning, um, you're letting the person find the solution to do one movement. Okay. Um, the methodical series of exercises, you're assembling a movement from the bottom up. Okay. Um, the uh, variability of practice, you are allowing person to adjust. You kind of parameterize their movement, but through different conditions. Okay, um, same with uh, certain the the constraint, the contextual interference. You're allowing person to build the motor program for a single movement. Okay, then there's ones that you develop multiple techniques, right? So um, certain types of con um, constraint. Yeah, you know, when you're using blocked um, uh, in contextual interference, you know you're developing different. You're developing chip shot, putting, and drive in golf, right? And differential learning, the idea is, of course, the strong differential learning is you're not developing one correct technique, right, to move. You're developing multiple ways to explore the environment and achieve these different goals. So the, this idea of developing a single technique versus multiple techniques is one kind of important point. Okay, so let's go. To, let's get into some of the specifics of, of how the authors define these. So, so first, the repetitive learning. Right. So they argue, and this is a point I'm I like to make, you know, the idea of repetition is is very, very old. Um the um the first <coughs> it came a lot from uh military fighting. Um interesting, they also point it came from religion, right? We are repeating rhythmic movements, doing uh repeated uh Bible verses, anything you want to think of like that. Repetition has been a very uh, strongly su suggested to be how we learn or become more pious or whatever, right? It's it's um 
It's a really interesting thing. Um, throughout the paper, obviously, because of where they're from, Wolfgang Schorn and colleagues are from Germany, where there's a lot of discussion of the German influences. They have a lot of good insights um, into this. You know, um, they they into really in gymnastics in the 18th, they really point out this is where the idea of repetition, the military idea of drills really came in. Um, this kind of, uh, you know, as I said, and, and then it kind of expanded into force. Okay. So their quote, overall repetition learning is mentioned in older literature, primarily in connection with military drill and education for obedience with a high level of guidance. And it was considered the solution to all learning processes without any differentiation of degrees of freedom, complexity, or the sensory systems that are stressed. Right. So the, the here's the correct technique, repeat it. Right. So this is the really old school, prescriptive, repetitive that I would rail against all the time. Okay. Interestingly, <laughs> and, and not surprisingly, uh, in some ways from, from talking to him, uh, Wolfgang Sohorn, the, uh, they lump the constraints led approach in this, right? The constraints led approach in their mind is repetitive learning. Okay. So they're quote, interestingly, this form of learning well known to educators currently experiencing a renaissance in competitive sports with a new name, the constraints led approach, where material or instructional aids are used to constrain the learner's movements in a way that guides him or her in the direction of the coach's learning aim. However, while in re repetitive learning errors are to be avoided and individual techniques are tolerated only at the highest level of performance as an inevitable byproduct, in the CLA, erroneous movements are allowed, but only to experience how not to do them. And individual techniques are accepted, but only within the guiding constraints. Okay. So obviously I don't agree with this, this uh, equa equating these two things, traditional repetitive learning with the constraints led approach, right? The, the, you know, the constraints led, uh, they, they use some of my research on you know the baseball batting research I've done on constraints in here as examples. I don't think when you, for example, give a pitcher a connection ball, it's the same thing as telling them the exact movement, right? You're allowing self-organization to occur within it. Obviously not as much self-organization as differential learning where they really can do everything they want, uh, anything they want. Um, but, you know, I think it, it's guiding, right? It's structuring variability rather than repetition, pure repetition. So. I, I think it's interesting. He, they think that it fits in there, and I think uh, it, it raises some interesting points. But obviously, I don't agree with that classification at all. Um, e, e, error there. I think the last point they were raising about errors is they're talking about using exaggeration of errors, right? Um, and pushing away. You know, I think the this idea. Uh, you know, I've kind of struggled with sometimes understanding what exactly differential learning is getting at because. You know, the, is it true their idea that there's no invariant, there's no form to any technique, right? I can really do anything I want, right? Um, constraints, I think, you know, are always there, right? So I don't, as I said, I don't really agree with this, this classification, but I'm just raising it. The second uh, model they talk about is discovery-based learning. So discovery, quote, discovery-based learning allows students to take charge of their learning through hands-on exploration and inquiry. Instead of memorization and repetition of concept, learning through unique experiences emphasized. In pedagogy, DBL is typically characterized by having minimal teacher guidance, solving problems with multiple solutions, minimal repetition and, rep and memorization. In psychological research, DBL is simplified as child to error learning. And they cite this nice quote by Rousseau, the only habit a child may adopt is that of adopting none, right? The idea that there's no one solution, Again, I, I don't see how this kind of separates itself from completely from the constraints led approach, right? Constraints led approach is giving an athlete problems that has multiple solutions with minimal repetition to me. Um, but I, I think, so I think this classification is more of a historical one that for me, I don't know whether it plays a value right now, right? You know, discovery-based learning, Discovery-based learning to me, I, I still, what's missing from this paper, um, interestingly, they have the models, but they don't have the theories for me. Um, Discovery-based learning for me is, uh, the, the, it's self it's equivalent, the cognitive psychology equivalent to self-organization, information processing, where the athlete figures it out cognitively, understanding, developing mental models on their own, right? 
So I think you need the theories here to really understand these differences, right? So discovery-based learning is different than constraints that approach, but not based on the, these kind of factors, some of the factors they're raising for me, but, but anyway, okay? Um, you know, interestingly, um, the authors lump nonlinear pedagogy in with discovery-based learning, um, which I, again, I don't quite understand this, this classification because as I've talked about before, really, um, you know, manipulation of constraints is one of the fundamental principles of nonlinear pedagogy. So how you can call constraints-based approach uh, rep one thing and nonlinear pedagogy a completely different thing, uh, I don't know. I think it, 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 it kind of confuses things. I think, again, we need the, the theory to, to understand these, not just these, these kind of models. But anyway, um, number three, the methodological series of exercises. Um, this is kind of the step-by-step -step construction of movement, okay? Um, you know, where you build up, for example, the components of a golf swing or a forehand in tennis. Um, the, the uh, quote, by introducing learners to successfully more complex forms of movement and play, everyone's respective starting abilities are considered, right? So we kind of build up from what the person starts with. A company called for self-activity and self-development. The learning child is expected to make erroneous movements in order to feel the correctness of purposeful ones, right? So we're building up to the set of exercises. Um, you know, learning aids are successfully removed, a gradual approach towards the end movement we want, breaking the movement down into the fundamentals, right? Um, so yeah, I think that's a really interesting approach. Um, that's you usually in part of the rep repetitive learning, but I think it, it definitely this is, is a good classification, okay? The methodical game series model is number four. Um, it's sometimes they later call it the games-based approach. Uh, quote, attempts to gradually address the more complex movements used in sports games by starting with games of reduced difficulty and more simplicity by incorporating a smaller number of players, smaller number of, field, uh, number of fields and simplified rules. These are successfully increased in number and size and number of complexity. Rules are increased following the pedagogical principle of moving from simple to complex, from easy to hard, end quote. Again, for me, that's the constraints that approach, right? That's a small sided game, right? That's manipulating constraints to move towards a certain um, affordance, certain kind of pa uh, solution, not a specific solution, but solutions with certain invariant components, okay? Um, again, quote, this approach has a specific role within the canon of motor learning approaches because the movement techniques that are necessary for each game are not specifically taught, rather they learn in the context of a game, right? So this is teaching games for understanding, game-based approach, small-sided games, all this. Again, I don't feel it's useful to lump all game-based approaches together, right? Because they have different goals based on your theoretical perspective, as I've talked about in, in previous episodes, right? But obviously, you know, I, I think it, it, teaching ga games is a definitely thing you can, you can talk about, moving away from fundamentals to games, okay? Um, so it's an alternative teaching method to teaching techniques, right? Isolated techniques, okay? Number five, the variability of practice model. Okay, so variability practice model, they talk about um, variability practice is more changing the stage of learning. Instead of pure acquisition, we're talking about stabilization. Um, variability practice model recommends stabilizing automatized movements by repeating invariant elements of those movements in combination with variable parameters and blocked order. Right? So the idea is you develop a, um, and they say the variable VP model relies on the schema model for motor control, which defines common movement classes as invariants and invariants and so on, right? This is the idea. This is Richard Smith's idea, right? The general motor program. You develop a general coordination pattern for kicking. Then you learn to parameterize it with the, in terms of the variance you face in the environment. Kicking to the top, kicking of the goal, kicking to the bottom, kicking on short grass versus long grass, right? So... The, the the variability of practice again i don't you know this this classification pigeonholing it as just a uh information processing schema theory again um i don't find uh very useful in terms of understanding practice design right you obviously you can put variability to practice without having to be that its goal is a general motor program and schema theory. But he's right that they're right that typically that's the way it was used initially. So I think there's, you know, that's kind of how they classify that 
Um, they now next come out with contextual interference as in a model, right? So contextual interference projects the phenomenon of learning a single movement by means of repetition with interleaved other movements, right? So the idea is it creates interference as you're developing your motor program, forgetting, reconstruction, whatever your theory happens to be, and that makes your motor program more resilient and stronger, right? That's the idea. Again, you know, I find this paper difficult because it's confounding theories and methods and models, right? Um, contextual interference is a theory to explain the effects of variability of practice. <laughs> um, so it's not a method in and of itself, right? It's a theoretical explanation for, right? Um, you can, the variability of benefits of variability of practice can be explained without appeal to contextual interference. So. So there's a lot of things going on here again this this type of classification okay um you know this idea they also talk about the idea that contextual interference brings in the idea of challenge point and challenge into the model as well um the last model they course they talk about is differential learning and they give a really nice definition not surprisingly since it's wolfgang schulhorn quote the differential learning model is based on the idea that learning requires the differences that are facilitated by adding stochastic perturbations during the learning process Depending on the individual situation, the differential learning model in its most extreme version is associated with no repetition and no augmented feedback to allow real self-organization process where no explicit guidance by an external agent about the solution is given to the athlete or learner, which includes not even by indicating errors. Okay. Quote, shortly thereafter, the initial mere amplification of noise is differentiated into the mutual optimal tuning of two noisy signals one coming from the instructed or chosen exercise that correspond to the objective information, the other caused by the learner's movements as subjective information. The tuning could potentially be described by the model of stochastic resonance, end quote. Now, this is something that I find challenging about differential learning, right? Um, on the one hand, to me, this seems to suggest that for differential learning, I literally could do anything I want. Right. I'm not giving any guidance as a coach so I can make you stand on your head and try to kick a ball, do it underwater, do it lying down. Right. Doesn't seem to obviously by choosing things that look like the actual movement. Right. By telling you to kick with a wider stance apart, uh, narrower stance. Right. I'm giving some guidance, I think. Right. Um, I'm not completely randomly choosing starting movements and positions. I'm choosing ones that are putting the variability around some solution that I have in mind, right? So I don't re agree that differential learning is a completely unlimited self-organization process. And I, I, I seem to get that message too when I talked to, like when I published um, my paper on baseball batting, I got comment, you know, I talked to Wolfgang Schulhorn a lot about it and he gave me a lot of great feedback and a very kind of him. But his, was, his point was that my... The conditions I chose for differential learning were not the right ones to be differential learning. How, if the, if it's completely unconstrained and unlimited and I'm not guiding, how could I get that be the case, right? So I, I don't understand quite what's here. The, and this goes back to the, his point about constraints that approach. I think in differential learning, you have in mind a, a set of solutions, right? You have in mind what the solution is gonna look like, right? Um, or why wouldn't we do soccer practice where you throw the ball in goal with your hands as part of differential learning, right? Why, why not, right? We, you're, as you're constraining it, right? You're guiding it towards something. You're not letting pure, unconstrained self-organization occur. I don't think that's, that's a fair categorization of it, right? Obviously, it's more than the constraints that approach. As I've always said, like constraints is pushing you towards this particular area of the perceptual motor landscape. Whereas differential learning is definitely exploring more of it, but there's still some guidance involved, right? So I, I have a bit of a problem with this kind of that constraints led approach is repetitive learning, forcing you to one solution and differential learning is pure self-organization. I think that is unfair based on what's out there in the published literature, right? From what I see, I don't think this is this is occurring at all. I think they're just doing two things in two different ways, using the same self-organization, the same underlying theory again. Okay. Um, other quotes about um, differential learning. Historically, a reinterpretation of Bernstein's mantra, repetition without repetition, led to reimagining a data of continuous variance in movement. To the end of the last century, greater tolerance developed for movement variability. The previously detrimental interpreted variances observed in various life sciences 
were accepted and renamed as functional variability or essential, essential noise, right? Um, so this is the idea, right? That, you know, we're all moving towards, I tried to put in my book, the, the revolution, revolution of repetition without repetition, the acceptance that variability, not pure repetition is good. You know, and um, the, um, he also takes another kind of shot across the bow of, of things that are dear to my heart, uh, the ecological dynamics, quote, a consistent integration of the contextual interference model into system dynamics along among numerous other inconsistencies is yet to be achieved within the eclectic ecological dynamics CLA approach, right? So obviously he has a, a problem with ecological dynamics, he thinks it's a random collection of things that don't really got, uh, explain very much, right? So this, uh, this, <laughs> there's kind of a thing he's trying to point across in this paper. Right. Obviously, I don't agree. And I could I could spend a half an hour trying to talk talk about this, but I'm, I'll just leave it that you, know, you can think about that. Um, the, so it, the talk about differential learning model, I'm going to I'm not going to go into all the details. Right. Obviously, the, all the studies I've talked about before in previous episodes. OK, so in the in the paper, they give some nice uh, classifications of the kind of what the the who's the the model for. When do you do? When did it come about? What is it for? Is it for acquiring, stabilizing, and, um, and automatizing, so on? And they classify in terms of the guidance, the degrees of freedom, right? Um, all these kind of different things. And right, um, the so obviously, not surprisingly, differential learning is the one that has all all the things, <laughs> right? It can do everything. Um, so I, as I said, but I, I kind of have an issue with that. Um, they also give kind of a nice timeline of when these things occur. Um, you know, uh, the most of them, for example, um, are focused on stabilizing, not actually acquisition and refinement, whereas differential learning, again, can be used for all of these things. And they show it in this figure that's in the, in the paper, right? So the the kind of general thing they're they're focusing on um, is the main come kind of some of the main messages is a great one. You know, the replication issue, the issue that we don't focus enough on the individual intrinsic dynamics of people. We don't really study pure coordination enough. We, we study things like uh, dart throwing and people that have been playing ball games all their life, right? So we're not really talking about pure learning a task, okay? Um, so they think this kind of, these are some issues that needs to be addressed and I, I definitely agree, okay? Um, the, uh, model, you know, part, they also point to the idea that there's n the kind of the idea that there's these generalized models of learning is, is flawed because we all have the own individual characteristic constraints, you know, which totally we buy and board in, um, in ecological dynamics. Um, so we need to, to develop more kind of the idea that there, we can come up with absolute facts about learning is, is kind of, um, limited, right? So overall, as I said, I think this is an interesting paper and I, I definitely, it's a challenging read. It's got a lot of things in it. Um, I like to see the way they think about these different approaches. I personally don't find the model classifications very useful um, for what I do. As I said, I always think guiding from the underlying theory of learning, right, is, is the way to go. But as I said, I, you know, I think it, it, it's an interesting read. I would encourage you to have a look. Okay, that's it for this episode. Um, thanks and cheers for now.